It's the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up. You've been sitting way too long. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. My name is Steve Grovan, along with my co-host David Feldman and the rest of the team. Hello, David. Good morning. And we have the man of the hour, Ralph Nader. Hello, Ralph. Hello, everybody. In the aftermath of Hamas's recent attacks on Israel, we've seen a lot of full-throated support of Israel, even among public figures who are ordinarily critical of their policies. Most would agree that the Israeli civilians who have been killed and kidnapped right now are victims. But are they victims only of Hamas? Or are they also the latest victims of the brutal policies of their own country's far-right leadership? And is it misguided to conflate compassion for Israeli victims with support for the Israeli military. Today on the program, we welcome Israeli journalist Gideon Levy, who spent much of his career reporting on the plight of the Palestinians. With regard to this most recent outburst of violence, Mr. Levy has said, quote, as long as Israel continues to believe the problem of Gaza will be solved by the sword, then we will get exactly to the same place. This vicious circle will not be solved by power, not be solved by tanks, and will not be solved by troops only by political agreement, unquote. Now, our original plan was to speak at length with Gideon Levy about the unfolding situation in Israel and Gaza. Unfortunately, a few minutes into our conversation, he had to evacuate to a shelter. So you'll be hearing all of that as it happened. We wish him well and plan to have him back on soon to continue the discussion. Luckily, joining our discussion today is our resident international law expert and constitutional scholar, Bruce Fine, Regular listeners know Bruce as a former Justice Department lawyer from the Reagan administration and a vocal critic of America's lawless empire. We will speak to him about the American reaction to what's going on with the Israeli government and Hamas. As always, we'll check in with our relentless corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. But first, let's speak, even if it's for a few minutes, to Israeli journalist Gideon Levy. David? Gideon Levy is a Haaretz columnist and a member of the newspaper's editorial board. He is the author of the weekly Twilight Zone feature, which covers the Israeli occupation in the West Bank and Gaza over the past 25 years, as well as the writer of political editorials for the newspaper. He is the author of the book, The Punishment of Gaza. Also joining us is a friend of the show, Bruce Fine, constitutional scholar. Welcome both of you to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Thank you so much. Welcome indeed, Gideon. These are, as David said, very difficult times. And before we get to Israel, Palestine, and Gaza, I want to get your view of what the United States position has been in the last few days, and especially President Biden's short address yesterday, which remarkably ignored the ongoing slaughter, bombing, devastation of Gaza by the Israeli government and focused his compassion on the Israeli victims of the Hamas assault, which isn't exactly a statesman-like position for a president of the United States who should be looking for a ceasefire and negotiations and pushing forward for a two-state solution. But he didn't take that opportunity. How was that speech received by you and your colleagues at the Haaretz newspaper. I can't speak on their behalf. I can tell you that, first of all, in Israel, it was a great success in terms of here we have such a friendly president, Zionist president, they called him. It made the biggest headlines with the feeling that the United States is behind Israel right now in an unconditioned way. Those who are a little more critical even saw this declaration as a green light for Israel to invade Gaza, to go for a ground operation, and practically to do whatever it wants until it will get out of control. If you ask me, I think that there was something moving in his uh, speech because he seemed very sincere, but I was really, really missing the other side, the Palestinians, the siege, the occupation, the apartheid, nothing of this exist in, in his world. It was really a speech of a Zionist, the old Zionist, the leader of the Jewish community of the United States, not of a statesman who sees 
the siege and sees the agony and the suffer of the Palestinians for the last decades and doesn't see the connection between this barbarian attack on Israel on Saturday and all those preconditions, which are all of them criminal and inhuman. Well, he missed an opportunity to try to control the spread of this war into Lebanon and elsewhere. And it was very unfortunate because he knew at the time that the Israeli government was cutting off water, food, medicine, electricity from the 2.2 million people in Gaza, which is only about twice the size of the District of Columbia. And that didn't prompt him to say, look, let all heads calm down here. We're sending over mediators. We're trying to curtail the struggle in the war from erupting in the Middle East. Nothing like that. He was nothing like President Eisenhower in 1956 when France, England, and Israel attacked Egypt. He had a press conference and he basically said, stop, in no uncertain terms. And they all stopped. There was nothing like Jimmy Carter's diplomacy, established peace between Egypt and Israel. And now we're seeing a massive slaughter of civilians. And I want to ask you, why did the Israeli precision bombers blow up ambulances, hospitals, clinics, schools, homes in Gaza? What is the military purpose of that? I'm not sure Israel knows what is the purpose. Israel is reacting as usual more to satisfy the public opinion. And the Israeli public opinion is demanding now in a very vocal way some kind of revenge over Gaza because I don't know how how were you exposed to what really happened on Saturday, but those were really barbarian scenes. Not everything was published, but There were barbarian scenes, really like ISIS, not less than ISIS. In many ways, people were slaughtered and even worse than this. So the emotions are calling now for revenge. And Israel uh, is following the emotions of the public opinion. As uh, Henry Kissinger stated once, Israel does not have foreign policy. It has only domestic policy. And what we see in Gaza is an outcome of uh, domestic politics. Even raised, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we, we have okay, bad so sound here. Uh, Mr. Levy, are you still with Your us? Your response? No, I had to go to the, there is a siren here and I had to go to the shelter. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry, sorry, we have to interrupt it now. Oh, you, you uh, seriously have to go. Yes. Yeah, it sounds like he had to evacuate. Good heavens. I don't know why. There must be these rockets, or they still have some rockets. How could they be shooting rockets when they're being carpet bombing? So, what should I doubt we're going to get him back? Now we're really messed up. Let's do this. David, why don't you give Bruce another intro and Ralph and Bruce discuss the constitutional treaty definitions here. Joining us is a friend of the show, constitutional scholar and specialist in international law, Bruce Fine. Welcome back. Welcome, Bruce. The news recently in the tragedy and the conflict between Israel and and Gaza elaborated what the Israeli government has in mind here as it now continues its massive bombing, slaughter, and devastation in Gaza, a little enclave of 2.2 million defenseless people. And the Minister of Defense said that the Israeli government was going to cut off water, food, medicine, fuel, electricity from the people of Gaza as the bombing is indiscriminate. Reports in the New York Times and elsewhere show that hospitals, clinics, schools, homes have all been subjected to indiscriminate devastation. And you say that this meets the definition of genocide. Can you elaborate? Yes, the Genocide Convention is finally ratified 
and became effective in 1951, but it was born of the Holocaust, which was prosecuted in part as a war crime at the Nuremberg Tribunal in 1946. And the Genocide Convention has several definitions of genocide, but one of them is deliberately inflicting on a group conditions of life calculated to bring about its destruction in whole or in part. And remember, the defense minister added to the elements of boycott that was anticipated that Israel viewed the Palestinians as, quote, animals and would act accordingly. The reason why that's important, because that suggests, you know, an intent, a psychological frame of mind, if you will. And it seems to me that combined with the previous privations that Israel has inflicted on all civilians in the Gaza Strip for decades, adding these on top of those are clearly going to be denying the civilians a fair opportunity to live, to be candid. They will die of starvation, disease, lack of shelter, or otherwise. If you have no food, how are you going to survive? You can't exit. You can't go to, <laughs> there's no way to flee. You can't go to Egypt. They've shut down all trespass across borders. Well, it's been called the, the world's largest open-air prison. The restrictions, the blockade, now the total siege is suffocating the people there. And they didn't ask for this fight. It was created as an enclave for Palestinian refugees in 1948. And they've been there ever since, as Gideon Levy said, without a single day of freedom. There has been assertions by leading Palestinians in the West Bank, such as Mr. Barghouti, who was on Democracy Now! and was questioned by Amy Goodman, that the extreme elements in the Israeli government leadership are really moving to drive the Gazans into the desert or into the sea and just completely evacuate Gaza. Now, given all this, what do you see as the position of the United States and Western Europe, they seem to be reacting to the brutal massacre in Israel by the Hamas fighters, but ignoring the wider slaughter that the Gazans are now being exposed to, and the possibility of involving Hezbollah and a wider conflict in the Middle East. And the Western European nations in the U.S. are simply asserting no holds barred support and more military equipment for the Israeli government. It sounds like a green light for genocide. How do you view the Western European countries in the U.S. position here? It doesn't have any diplomatic content. No, it doesn't, Ralph. And I, I say this with great reluctance, but I think it's true that international relations going back to the Peloponnesian War was as Thucydides described it. The strong do what they can, the weak suffer what they must. The duplicity, the double standards leap out every single day. Take, for example, the denial of a state for Palestine. In our own Declaration of Independence in 1776, 1776 says, you know, legitimate governments derive the legitimacy from the consent of the governed to secure their life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And when a government becomes destructive of those rights, they have a right to replace it. Well, the last election we had in Gaza, you know, Hamas won, and the United States said, well, they're not supposed to win. So <laughs> they said, no, you can't win the election. Uh, Self-government doesn't apply to you. So the fact is, and it's because unfortunately, it's, it's not limited to just this particular clash now, if you will, the genocide, a clash between Israel and the Palestinians. It's global, and I see it regularly elsewhere. You know, whether it's in Burma, Myanmar, Congo, Nigeria, that's what happens. And because the European countries, the United States, feel it's not in their interest politically, you know, to defend the Palestinians. So who cares? And unfortunately, the Arab countries in that vicinity, you know, Bahrain, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, maybe a little bit less than Qatar, Kuwait, they get the money. They know that they can't antagonize the West too much. They get the oil money and the protection from the West. So they say a few things, but nothing, in fact, is done. So in the international arena, justice is subordinated to power. And that's what we have here. And when 
President Biden yesterday says, oh, we're all in favor of a rule-based international order. Well, he's supporting the very definition of genocide. It shows you how incredibly hypocritical and callous these politicians are. I don't want to single out Biden because I think politicians in general are that way. And I'm not going to exclude some of those who are Palestinians, too. It's a universal sociopathology you know, in the political figures. And it's very, very tragic because who loses? The peaceful civilians who want nothing more than a better life and an opportunity to develop their faculties and have families. You mentioned Declaration of Independence, which was also a detailed declaration of resistance to the tyranny of George III and the call for a revolution. Now, American politicians constantly say Israel has a right to defend itself, as any nation does. They've never said the Palestinians have a right to defend themselves. And who is the oppressor? Who is the occupier? Who's yeah. stealing the land? Who's invading the area of West Bank at will, smashing houses, killing people, and engaging in a blockade? It's Israel. So if Israel has a right to defend itself, all the more Palestine has a right to defend itself against illegal occupation of the remnant of the original Palestine, which in the West Bank amounts to about 22% of the original Palestine. And give us an idea, Bruce, of the array of constitutional, statutory, and international violations by the U.S. in its decade-long support of the Israelis. Yeah, well, the first is that, you know, the, the crime of the war of aggression, which is one of that we participated in in establishing the charter for the International Military Tribunal in Nuremberg, you know, it means that you can go to war only in self-defense. And once you complete self-defense, you know, you don't have license to walk over the world and destroy everyone. And Israel has been fighting war in the West Bank and Gaza. They don't have sovereignty over it, not in self-defense. Self-defense means that, you know, they've actually attacked you, not attacked in response to a provocation. And the United States has gone out of its way to say, OK, well, we'll agree that we will not dispute you know, your sovereignty. Although if the Israelis had sovereignty over the West Bank, they'd have civilian law rather than military law being applied to the Arabs. But it's military law that applies. But the, the one that comes to mind most frequently is the, the requirement of proportionality that engaged in conflict, it's a prohibition to use military force that's dramatically in excess of, in, in its risk to civilian casualties and suffering or destruction of property, vastly in excess to the importance of the military objective stated. And when you had asked uh, Gideon Levy, well, what's the military objective right now in Gaza? He said he didn't think there was a military objective other than, not military, there was just a political objective to propitiate the anger of the Israelis who see you know, their loved ones lost, killed. I'm not going to deny that there's not violence on the other side as well. You know, this is this is not a case of saints battling each other, but that's what he said. And so you're supposed to limit the magnitude of the violence proportionate to the importance of the military objective. I don't know whether there's any military objective that looks, you know, to an end game. The military people always tell you, you can't kill your way out of a war. I don't think Israel's learned that lesson. I think that's all they have in store here. They're going to kill. kill. Well, talking, uh, the talking about proportionality, I think over the last 25, 30 years, the casualties of innocent Palestinians compared to casualties of innocent Israelis is about 400 to 1. That's deaths, injuries, and uh, side effect diseases, for example. Only 10% of the people of Gaza have access to clean water. There's a 40% level of anemia among Gaza children. So there's a huge disproportionality here. But go back to Washington, D.C.'s violation of the Constitution and statutes here in the U.S.'s policy to Israel. Yeah, see, when we become, there's a concept in the law, it's called co belligerency. You know, with, with, with the same as it puts you at risk, the same risk as a belligerency. Co belligerency means you are supplying systematically military support in one way or another to a belligerent. So when we're systematically providing Israel, which is what we're doing, perhaps even more than they're asking for, the military equipment, the intelligence, whatever, 
to fight wars and Congress has not declared war at all. This is a unilateral effort by Mr. Biden. And people say, well, if you let Congress vote on it, they would do the same thing. Well, then they need to vote on it and say, we want to be declared a co-belligerent. We'll accept the risk of being a co-belligerent. We can be attacked because when you're co-belligerent, you're at war and you're subject to attack like any other belligerent by the opposition, by the enemy, so to speak. So all these things continue forward without the congressional involvement whatsoever. The Congress, unfortunately, they unilaterally have surrendered their war power long time ago because they don't want to vote. They just want to have all the responsibility in the present. They derelict. We could be primaried if we had to vote on this issue. It's controversial. So let us abdicate our responsibilities. So it's a messed up system in the United States. And we pay no attention, as I say, to international law. How could we at the one time say on the Condoleezza Rice, we needed, we said, we need elections in Gaza. And so they had elections and Hamas one said, well, we're not going to accept the, the outcome of the election because we don't like it. Really? That's promoting self-government? I mean, it's such a joke. And moreover, you could see why I believe that the Israelis could be emboldened because, you know, their boycott, the excessive use of force to damage civilians is just a takeoff of what the United States has said as an example. And we all can remember, perhaps, the most infamous statement that's then Secretary of State Madeleine Albright made on 60 Minutes to Leslie Stahl when she was confronted with the fact the embargo, the boycott the United States was inflicting on Iraq had killed 500,000 children, more than had died at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And her response, it was worth it. You know, okay. <laughs> and what was our military objective? I mean, nobody even knows. We're still there now. We have no clue what we're doing. So we are a very, very bad example ourselves in trying to limit you know, other countries where you have to act according to proportionality. Another example, under Donald Trump, he dropped the mother of all bombs in Afghanistan just to show how strong we could be. What was the military objective? Nothing other than to flex his muscles and see I'm a tough guy, which is clearly another war crime. So it puts us in a very awkward position to go hold Israel to a standard that we don't ever apply to ourselves. Let's go back to the stream of military equipment supplied by the United States, the most modern military equipment, fighter jets and artillery and all kinds of other military arms to Israel. Under federal law, the U.S. is banned from selling or donating military equipment to countries who use this equipment offensively instead of defensively. Describe that situation over the years. Well, we have simply just ignored the limitation. And remember, on, unfortunately, the, the laws are enforced by the executive branch. Uh, it's supposed to take care that the laws be faithfully enforced rather than sabotaged. But that same issue arose with the Israeli incursion in Lebanon, 19, I believe, 80, 81, 82 with Alexander Haig, and Israel was using the weapons, the cluster bombs we had given them offensively in southern Lebanon. So now we'll just turn around and say, oh, but it was all defensive. No, none of it was offensive because it was all in response to the attack of the Palestinians. But as we well know, Ralph, in law, if you have provoked an attack on yourself, and then you can't then kill in self-defense after you're the one who provoked the attack. I mean, that's common in our law of homicide. And if you create conditions of life that are intolerable, no one would, you don't find that you have an immigration problem in the Gaza, you know, wanting people wanting to live there because the conditions are so harsh and stark. It, what do they think is going to happen? There's no hope. There's nothing. And then you end up with this kind of violent response. Let me read a couple of short sentences from Gideon Levy's recent article in Haaretz, the Israeli newspaper. He says, quote, Gaza, most of whose residents are refugees created by Israel. Gaza, which has never known a single day of freedom since 1948. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu bears very great responsibility for what happened, and he must pay the price. But it didn't start with him, and it won't end after he goes. We now have to cry bitterly for the Israeli victims, but we should also cry for Gaza. The Hamas fighters who, with low-tech equipment, breached the barrier and moved into Israel and attacked the villages. Many of those fighters had lost members of their own family in prior 
Israeli attacks, especially the giant one in 2014 and 2008. In 2014, over 400 children in Gaza were killed. And these fighters are now all dead, according to the Israeli government, 1,500 of them. So it was more like a suicide attack. They knew they were going to die, and they were going to take Israelis with them. And it was a cry by Hamas to the world that you are not going to ignore the Palestinian question as you are moving to establish relations between Saudi Arabia and Israel, and basically circumventing the 56 years of occupation militarily and otherwise by Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza. And so what we've seen here is the result of an abandonment by Congress completely completely. to oversee this situation over the years. All they do is pass resolutions with over 90 percent of the members of Congress reacting to AIPAC and others while the Israelis are slaughtering Palestinian civilians and say, go for it. And I think Biden's statement yesterday was a very dangerous green light to say to the Israeli government, you can do whatever you want, and we're going to supply you with whatever you want in terms of weapons. Your response? Well, I think that's accurate, Ralph. And I think it shows that even foreign policy is driven by domestic considerations. I think Biden's worried about 2024. He wants to get as many votes as he can. And he's worried that Trump is the nominee. You know, he moved the embassy to Jerusalem and, you know, he's got to be worried about the migration of votes or the continuing votes from some Jews to Trump. It's a political calculation. Uh, It's totally divorced from reality on the ground in the Middle East, in Gaza and in Israel. And that's how Congress reacts as well. It's all driven by, I want to be in power and stay in power. There's no moral element to it whatsoever. Zero. Yeah. And of course, Joe Biden in his speech hardly referred to Congress. Why should he? Congress has turned itself, as you have said, into an inkblot. Instead of pushing for a ceasefire, Joe Biden is pushing warships toward that tormented area. And as usual, U.S. taxpayers will pay the bill. And who is Joe Biden representing? And what is he standing for in terms of the U.N. Charter, international law, and the U.S. national interest? That question isn't even being discussed in the United States. No, it's not. And it's just all he's doing it for is political domestic considerations. And I try to say this and inject, you know, a little bit of lightness in what's a very bleak discussion here. That's why Netanyahu was reported to have said when he was asked whether he'd want Israel to become the 51st state of the United States, he reached part, no, I'd lose 100 votes in the Senate. No, he'd only have two. And that's how categorically the United States supports Israel, president, Congress, without asking any questions. We have automatically give them without any oversight, three to $4 billion in military economic aid annually, even though it's far richer than the countries that we give very sparingly to, because this is how they feel that they can obtain votes. And that's what I think is a very, very sad situation, Ralph, is in our politics. Maybe it's been around a long time, is that justice has very little or no weight in the balance. It's, will this help me get power or not? It's the only intellectual universe in which these people operate. And the result is crimes, injustice, war, conflict, and we see the huge mess. And unfortunately, Ralph, it isn't limited to right now. That's the TV cameras are on. To what extent you think Biden's overreacting to the Republican Party, which is goading him and basically daring him to be more aggressive on behalf of Israel than they are as a party in Congress. I think you're exactly right, Ralph. I think this is just a political calculation, not just the Republican Party, but possibly Mr. Trump being his rival in 2024. And he worries, well, you know, Trump will jump on him, say, you know, this is what I did to Israel. And this is, you know, I recognize their sovereignty over the West Bank and go on heights and move the embassy that no other president did. So he's worried about that. He's not worried about actually factually describing the horrors that are ongoing, including the violations of international law. 
And it's so disgusting to have him repeat, well, we're all in favor of a rule-based international order as he violates the rule-based international order that he currently praises. I mean, really? You have no embarrassment about saying that as you're supporting you know, genocidal conditions of life to destroy a group and you're championing a rule-based international order? And I say the other irony here, and I say this without trying to at all suggest that compassion is needed for all the suffering on both the Israeli and the Palestinian side, is that the genocide, it was born of the Holocaust. If anybody should be sensitive to the genocide convention, more than anyone else, it would be Israel. But unfortunately, you know, well, that barely doesn't really come into play very much. Well, over the years, the vituperative talk by Israeli high officials toward the Palestinians is really genocidal talk. They talk to them as vermin, snakes, animals have to be destroyed, evicted. Yes. All this is a matter of record. You're talking about ministers in the Israeli government, You're talking about heads of state. It's interesting that the founder of Israel, David Ben-Gurion, didn't use words like that against the Palestinians. He was pretty frank. Coming out of the Holocaust, he was going to establish a homeland in Palestine, no matter what, no matter what the inconvenience is to the inhabitants there. And he once said to Nahum Goldman, who was the head of the World Zionist Organization, he said, it was their land and we took it. He's it very candid. This is a widely reported quote. But now there isn't any kind of conciliation given the overwhelming superpower of Israel over the defenseless Palestinians. And this raises an interesting question here of anarchy versus international law. Why aren't the international law experts in the United States more aggressively speaking out over the years? They're almost silent. Their discipline seems to be under attack. There's almost nothing left of international law, not just in the Middle East, but all over the world. Countries do whatever they want to do. Why are the international law specialists not connecting with each other and making statements about the wreckage here by governments who think they can do whatever they want? Well, in part, Ralph, I think it's because there's no platform. You know, if you made a statement like we're talking today, they would never print this New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post. No way. They censor anything that tries to call, you know, your own country to account for wrongdoing, you know, international wrongdoing of a high sort. So there's you have basically you have no audience. And the second thing is that it's unfortunate that international law says it's, it's honored in the breach rather than the occurrence. They write down all these norms, but because you know we don't have one world sovereignty. There's no one who enforces them. And so they end up being advisory only. You pick it up and you use it to condemn your enemy and then you do the same thing yourself. And that's the world that we live in because we do not have any culture. We don't have any unwritten restraints on power to do whatever it can get away with. And people will do whatever they feel, no matter what the moral scruples dictate otherwise, to gain power, to fight and get authority over other people. The unfortunate thing is the horrors in the Middle East right now, they're not unique. I deal with it, you know, look in the Congo, look in Myanmar. I, you know, I went recently over to the into Katuli in Burma. You know, they bomb refugee camps there too. And it's not just there. They you got, you got genocide against the Rohingya. Anyway, it's that's what makes, you know, international law is so fragile. It's like, you know, you can deliver a wonderful, it's international law, it's best is like Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. But how did the Sermon on the Mount work out in practice? You know, it's delivered on the place where it's more bloodstained than any other place in the world. It doesn't mean that we don't speak out ourselves, but I'm just going to describe reality out there in terms of what we can expect. Well, let's talk about the last bastion of international law, which is the international court. In The Hague, you've worked before that court on a number of cases. Enlighten us about the international court, whether the U.S. is a member. Give us some idea as to whether this court has any practical jurisdiction over the situation in the Middle East. Yes. The International Court of Justice was created under the United Nations Charter. It sits in The Hague. There are 15 members. They are elected, I believe, for nine-year terms. 
They're regionally dispersed by governments, however, but they're supposed to be independent. But you can imagine it's, it's politicized, but not as politicized as, say, the UN Security Council or General Assembly. And it has jurisdiction over suits between nations that arise under international law or treaties like the Genocide Convention. The difficulty you have is, okay, you render a judgment. It doesn't have any armed forces to enforce it. You know? So <laughs> if you're on the losing side, so what? It's just a scrap of paper, as John McCoy said about the U.S. Constitution when he supported locking up all the Japanese Americans in World War II. So it's there. It has some influence. But I mean, I, I remember the case against uh, the mining of the harbors in Nicaragua that was held to be a violation of international law and the ICJ. And the United States said, well, so what? We're not going to recognize your authority and never complied with anything. So, again, we have an organ that is capable of adjudicating claims. Again, that it can adjudicate any claim of one nation against another for a violation of international law. But the hard part is, OK, but, you issue the judgment. How do you enforce it? But the U.S. isn't even a member of the International Criminal Court. Isn't that no, correct? No. Yes. I, I think we need to distinguish here, Ralph, and, and I apologize for sounding too professorial, between the International Court of Justice, which handles civilian cases between nations, the International Criminal Court. You're correct. We never even read it. We're not even a member of that. But that handles criminal prosecutions against individuals natural people, not countries. And for example, that's they're investigating Putin for alleged war crimes in Ukraine. And we aren't even a member of that, but we encourage other people to be prosecuted before the International Criminal Court. And we've actually told other countries, no, we're not going to, you, you have to give us protection. If we have our troops in your country, you will never refer our soldiers to the International Criminal Court. It's called Article 98. The vast majority of nations belong to the International Criminal Court. Which countries other than the U.S. do not? Oh, Israel does not. Pakistan, India, China, Russia does not. So you have it, it, the, the, still the vast majority because you're talking about a total universe of oh, approaching 200. But you've got a, a dozen serious nations that have not ratified. They're the ones who are most likely to commit violations themselves and the last people who want to sign up. So... We've been talking with Bruce Fine, constitutional and international law expert and practitioner. Let's go to Steve for any comments or questions, Steve. Yeah, actually, I want to, Ralph, defer to Francesco DeSantis, who's brought up an interesting point. The question that I had related to the role of Christian Zionism, especially as it relates to the domestic politics of this issue with President Biden and former President Trump, for instance, a 2018 Lifeway poll, according to the Washington Post, found that 80% of evangelical Christians in the U.S. believe that the creation of Israel in 1948 was a fulfillment of a biblical prophecy that would bring about Christ's return. And with the obvious demographic <laughs> whopping difference between Jews and Christians in this country, I wanted to see what you believe that what role that plays in, in the domestic politics. Well, I think, the, uh, the, I think that you're spot on. Uh, certainly, the vast majority of the evangelical Christian community in the United States supports Israel, and they believe that its existence is a fulfillment of the second coming of the Messiah. Israel itself does not believe that because <laughs> they don't believe that Jesus was the Son of God. But you, know, you put aside quibbles like that when you're coming together to try to uh, amass power. And so... The Christian voter is a very, very strong force for the United States, giving carte blanche to Israel to do whatever it wants. And they were very, very supportive when Mr. Trump moved our embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. David? Pardon the expression, Henry Kissinger. I apologize for bringing <laughs> him up. But if Richard Nixon were president, and this were, say, 1973, what would shuttle diplomacy look like? What would Nixon and Kissinger be doing now with Netanyahu and the Palestinians? What would diplomacy look like if we had a president who, instead of saying it is the duty of Israel to attack Hamas, if, if we had a president who counseled temperance, like Ralph was saying earlier, what would that look like if, if, if Anthony Blinken our Secretary of State was in Israel to negotiate as opposed to promising 
more weapons. I think the first thing you have to do if we're going to be involved is we have to at least give an external exhibition of being neutral. I mean, right now, the Palestinians would never say we're neutral. They just look, turn the TV on, says, why we're turning diplomacy on? We already have, we're, we're negotiating against ourselves. So the United States, if it's going to be any kind of negotiating partner, would have to say, you know, we've got to cut off our aid to Israel. You know, we need to make sure that humanitarian aid gets into Gaza so people aren't starving to death. And then with that, and they say they're convinced that there's got to be some kind of peaceful resolution consistent with the wishes, the consent of the governed, and, and then convene. I don't know, it could, could be Camp David Summit, it could be someplace else. But I think we do have the resources that can have pressure. Uh, that, that enabled Carter, for example, to negotiate the Camp David Agreement between Egypt and Israel. But unless we ourselves are able demonstrably to demonstrate we're neutral, there's no, there's, there's no first step to even begin the diplomacy. Anna? Thank you. Bruce, America is a settler colonial state. Our foundations are kind of similar to that of Israel, that we were we were founded by settlers and structured our our country to push out the native inhabitants by whatever means necessary. And I'm curious with your knowledge of, you know, America's founding principles, what role that plays in how we approach the apartheid state and the atrocities in Israel? Yeah, it's it's a wonderful question. And it's not just, you know, it took like uh, 600 years to disavow what was called the doctrine of discovery announced by the Pope, you know, hundreds of years ago when they're trying to how the Western world would divide up, you know, all the other species. But I think if you want to push back far enough, you know, every border in the world was created simply by who has the greatest military power. I mean, you want to go back far enough. I'm sure you could. there could have been people before the Native American Indians that Columbus discovered were here as well. I mean, species have been around a long time. <laughs> I don't know how many thousands of years, millions of years the Earth has exist. And it's unfortunate, but you got to accept the idea that every single boundary in the world is, in a moral sense, artificial. It didn't come from God, didn't come from the sky, it didn't come because people displayed greater morality than anyone else. Just because, hey, they had the ability to be there and fight off you know, people who wanted to take the land away from. And so that nobody really has the moral high ground you know, in the sense that you were discussing on saying, oh, our borders are sacrosanct, but nobody else's are because they were given to us because we were so virtuous. <laughs> They're there because they had guns to be candid about. The only reason why we don't recognize that is because you... We don't know all the histories far enough back to understand who was exterminated for the French become France and the Germans and the Yugoslavs and the Serbians or whatever, and Americans. And that's why we need to recognize that that we're all, you know, we're all, but we, we got to hang together. We all hang separately. That boundaries, however, can be prudentially useful because they at least is some working formula to prevent there to be constant warfare and every boundary is up and new and you can fight over. But it's a prudential judgment. It's not the sanctimony that, hey, you're subhuman, you're an animal, if you don't agree with X, Y, Z. And it's that kind of humility that we need to have that enables us to engage in conversation and be trustworthy partner in the discourse here. But Hannah, I can guarantee you, there's no country in the world that's got clean hands when it comes to their borders. Not one. Oh, I would never, I, I would never imply such a thing. So I'm just saying that you're right, but I don't, I, I, so the United States may feel, hey, how can we go ahead and, you know, we're the ones also who took over land too, so why should we complain that Israel's doing what we did? But they can say that about, they, they can say that about Putin going into Ukraine as well. So, that, but they say there isn't any, any, uh, you know, consistency principled approach to this. It's just whatever I can get away with, I will, you know. The strong do what they can, might makes right, the, the weak suffer what they must, and let's move on. It's a wonderful formula when you happen to have all the nuclear weapons or most of them in the world and are super powerful. It's not so wonderful when you're weak. Steve, yeah. you have a question? Well, Bruce, I have a constitutional question for you. I about 11 or 12 years ago, I spent about five weeks in Israel. I was working and uh, I made a lot of friends and had a lot of great political discussions, but I came away from that with sort of my amateur political science assessment that the state of Israel is fatally flawed in that when you base a country on an identity, 
whether that's a heritage or ethnicity or a religion, as opposed to what our founders did in the 1700s, where it was based on an idea, which was revolutionary at the time, that it seems like once you base this a country on an identity, it's inevitable that you're going to have apartheid. Is that a fair assessment? I think it's a fair assessment. It's maybe a little bit incomplete. I think a Ben Gurion, you you know, the kind the Israel really doesn't have a constitution that's basic laws. But obviously Ben Gurion thought he country needed there need to be a country where a Jew could come as refuge if there was another attempted Holocaust. But he didn't attempt to exclude others. Certainly not face that's why twenty percent of the Israeli population as we speak is twenty percent are Arab. They're not Jews. But in so far as we look at their legal, you know, their infrastructure, their unwritten rules, if you're not a Jew there, <laughs> you're a second class citizen. You know, you're not necessarily conscripted into the army. You know, they don't do the policing the same. So it's a little bit like, you know, blacks in the United States during Jim Crow. OK, they were technically Americans, but they really didn't enjoy you know, citizenship if you were white. And that I do believe is a result of the fact that they're built on this idea that, hey, Yahweh, God gave this land to Jews, to Abraham, Moses. You know, so it's ours because of our religious identity, not for any other reason. And that being the conviction, I think, of a very large majority of Jews, certainly the Orthodox Jews, how can it be otherwise then? You're going to treat people who are not part of the chosen people as lesser people. And you end up with some, whether you call it the apartheid South African style, or Jim Crow style, or Israeli style, that's built into the system. And the only way you could do, get, in my judgment, to try to move forward to be do something like we did in our constitution and say, no, we're a secular country. There can be no religious test oaths for anything. You know, that's, we're all the same under the law. And we welcome anybody who complies with the law and we don't really ask about their religion whatsoever. And I don't think certainly now that that could come about in Israel, given the strength of the Orthodox Jews who don't believe that whatsoever. Given the current events and the destruction of Gaza, Biden should really demand an immediate ceasefire and negotiate to establish a truce. He's got to try to be an honest broker. And instead, he's a ditto head bullhorn for more military activity by Israel. This is the low point in presidential positioning on the Middle East conflict since the end of World War II. And there's nobody in government to call him to account. The Senate and House don't have hearings. They didn't have thorough hearings on Afghanistan, on Iraq, on Libya at all. They just rubber stamped tens of billions of dollars every year for the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. Whereas years ago, Senator Fulbright had very thorough hearings on Vietnam, which had uh, consequences to getting out of that conflagration. It's a dead zone in terms of dealing with international conflict from a preventive point of view or from an anticipatory point of view, or even now from a restorative point of view. And the danger is that this war now going on is going to spread to Lebanon, and it could then spread to Syria, and other countries get involved, and who knows where it'll go from there. We don't have a president who puts a diplomatic break on his ally, even though his ally has been dependent for decades on U.S. military support, diplomatic cover, and getting other countries to stand in line behind the U.S. on the Israeli position vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians. Do you see anything coming in the next few days, Bruce Fine, that has any light at the end of the tunnel? I don't, Ralph, because I don't see anything in the U.S. domestic political equation that would be a headwind against what Biden has already pronounced as full-fledged, unconditional support for Israel. I don't see anything for anybody to go criticize that position other than it wasn't even as as, as broad as it ought to be. We have no statesmen anymore around. All these people, all they care about and think about is the next election cycle and what plays X, Y, Z. They don't think about suffering. They don't think about morality, rule of law or anything. How can we stay in power? 
for the next cycle. And unfortunately, we've become we become a country with zero statesmen. I mean, complete zero. So how can we be optimistic? I don't say that with pleasure, but I, I don't want to you know, be Pollyannish and say, OK, yeah, something's going to happen. I don't see anything changing whatsoever. Let's look at the internal politics of Israel. More than a million Israelis demonstrated against Netanyahu's intent to weaken the judiciary and undermine any kind of democratic control over the Knesset or over the prime minister by the Supreme Court of Israel. Now, although everybody's in solidarity because of the assault on the villages in southern Israel, there's going to start the process of recrimination about how this pompous prime minister's intelligent failure led to this situation. And there may be a Knesset vote, perhaps of no confidence. Isn't that the system they operate under? Couldn't they possibly bring Netanyahu down, form a new government? Ralph, just today, the opposition joined forces with Netanyahu. They have now a government of national unity. So... <laughs> That kind of put the kibosh on. And you talk about the Knesset. When a declaration of war was made, it was made solely by the executive. The Knesset had no voice in it whatsoever. But as we speak right now, Israel has now, the, politically, has now unified. They have a, a, a is like, you know, Britain during World War II. They, had a, they now have a government of national unity. But unlike World War II, Gaza will be in ruins in a few days. And then the recriminations will start. There's a huge boiling anger in Israel about the intelligence failures. They put that at the feet of Prime Minister Netanyahu. So it could unravel quickly after the initial solidarity, which is not surprising. Yeah, I'm just saying right now, politically, from what we can see, is that you know the, all the, the, the opposition to Netanyahu has basically surrendered and said, OK, we're part of your government. So and that just happened today. So. I don't know. I mean, it could could come unravel because politics, we know, everybody knows, is very fragile. And people, you know, after even the Yom Kippur war termed against Egypt, you know, Golda Meir had to step down because there's similar intelligence failure. That could happen here. But right now, I'm not optimistic that it will. There's still an opportunity here for the people to register their opposition. And then the remaining challenge is to get that congressional sentiment turned around by People are fed up with endless wars and criminal wars of aggression to reach the White House, which is a runaway imperial presidency under both Democrat and Republican presidents. We never know. You know, you don't know in, in advance, you know, whether your protest is going to succeed. We you know you, we don't we're not clairvoyant. But I think that the high watermark of, of being a citizen is standing up and protesting, even if it doesn't result in anything. I go back and think I started before. The very first person who said, you know, slavery is bad, probably got wiped out. We don't know who they were. Somebody had to start the conversation, even though it took a long time for it finally was honored. First person who said, hey, you know, women aren't chattel. Somebody has to start the conversation. And that's why even if in the short run, hey, it looks like we're really climbing a steep hill. We're at the bottom of Mount Everest. Somebody's got to do it. And at least we in the United States with our heritage, we're the ones as citizens to say it. Maybe it doesn't result in anything. If we all do it, it is going to result in something. It's not hopeless. But we are speaking to posterity, even if the current generation turns a deaf ear, and that makes it worth it. It doesn't even require all of us, just a small minority of active citizens in congressional districts supported by public opinion, as I've said numerous times, can turn Congress around. If they know what they're talking about and they persist, that's what happened eventually with the Vietnam War, public opinion turned against it. And Congress said to the presidency, we're not giving you any more money. They cut off appropriations, which they haven't done since on Iraq and Afghanistan, Libya, Ukraine, whatever. They're not using the appropriation power. They're basically saying to the president, we'll give you whatever you want. What makes it even more anguishing, Ralph, is that they have these special inspectors general who in Afghanistan, they come back with these reports saying the, the corruption is massive. So Congress sees all, all the money going down the drain and they still do nothing. They still keep appropriating. Skip, they, despite all cigars, that's what it's called, the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan, Pakistan and Iraq. When Even when they get the report showing staggering 
tens of billions wasted money. They still kept appropriating 300 million bucks every single day. Didn't stop. One well, they day. went one. They went one step further. The Congress and did something. They affirmatively rejected a proposal in Congress to establish an inspector general for the forthcoming tens of billions of dollars to Ukraine. Bruce, in the context of our discussion, which of your books would you like our listeners to read? Well, I mean, the, the two, the best the American empire before the fall in constitutional peril. They're the ones that lay out exactly how far we've fallen. You know, We've been talking with Bruce Fine, constitutional and international law expert. Thank you very much for coming on once again, Bruce. And I'm sure the subject matter we discussed will be continued. Unfortunately, you're exactly right. Probably come back in two months and probably talking about the same things. We've been speaking with Gideon Levy and Bruce Fine. We will link to their work at ralphnaderradiohour.com. Now it's time to hear from our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyver. From the National Press Building in Washington, D.C., this is your corporate crime reporter morning minute for Friday, October 13, 2023. I'm Russell Mokhyver. More than halfway through his term, President Biden has yet to nominate an administrator to lead the Pipeline and Hazardous Material Safety Administration, or FIMSA, within the Department of Transportation. That's according to a report from the American Prospect. In the aftermath of the Norfolk Southern train derailment, FIMSA played an indispensable role in keeping America safe from toxic chemicals. The agency, though small, is responsible for regulating pipelines and overseeing transportation of many dangerous materials throughout the country, including flammable fuels, radioactive substances, and chemicals. Yet, the post at the agency has been vacant for years now. For the Corporate Crime Reporter, I'm Russell Mokhyber. Thank you, Russell. Welcome back to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. I'm Steve Scrovan, along with David Feldman, Hannah, Francesco, Ralph. The whole team's here. But that's our show. I want to thank our guests again, Gideon Levy and Bruce Fine. For those of you listening on the radio, we're going to cut out now. For you podcast listeners, stay tuned for some bonus material we call The Wrap Up, featuring Francesco DeSantis. And in case you haven't heard, a transcript of this program will appear on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour Substack site soon after the episode is posted. Join us next week on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, everybody. It's good we had uh, Bruce Fine on our show. He's coming out with a new report called Congressional Surrender, a tutorial for members of Congress and their staff. You know what's right and you know what's wrong. Rise up. Don't let the system hold you down. Stand up. Oh. Stand up. Oh. You've been oh. saying it oh. way too long. Wow, wow. 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 Say you're tired of trying